You are listening to the Web3 Creators Podcast, where we speak to the brightest minds and builders in crypto, DeFi, NFTs, and the metaverse. Our goal is to give you the absolute best tools for building a thriving business in the Web3 space. Now, here's your host, Hernan Arbor. Let's start creating. Guys, I'm super excited. This is our first ever episode uh, and uh, we have here nonetheless than uh, the man and the legend himself, Eyal Herzog. So just as a quick intro, Eyal is the founder and CEO of DWeb and the BDS Network. Uh, he's the found and founder and product architect of Bancor. So he was uh, designing the AMM protocol for Bancor, which is what we today call DeFi. So that's a big one. And uh, back in 2012, he created AppCoin. So he was already uh, creating alternative currencies back in 2012. And if we go back to 2004, he founded MetaCafe, which is uh, uh, what you know today, uh, you know, as, uh, as YouTube. Uh, it didn't, didn't take off as YouTube, but it was at par uh, at that time. So he's considered a true OG in the crypto and blockchain community. He's been a leader and a guy and an eternal musical entrepreneur spirit. So please uh, join me in welcoming uh, to the stream uh, the man and the legend himself, Eyal Elton. Eyal, how are you? I'm doing well, doing well. It's a nice Friday here in Israel. Yes. So, 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 what are you up to? Tell us, uh, tell, tell us how's the, uh, how's the, uh, how's your uh, busy life and and how's the life in general? How are you, how are you experiencing this uh, crypto downturn? So, uh, you know, the last uh, almost, I think almost three years, I've been uh, really, really focused on uh, BBS uh, networks and and, and D Web. Um, and I'm not, you know, I'm not an investor myself. I don't, you know, I don't, don't trade tokens, coins. I don't play DeFi. <laughs> uh, just, I, I never like, you know, um, to, to kind of play those financial games. You know, some people, my kids seem to love it, by the way, but <laughs> you didn't get those genes from me. Well. <laughs> you should take care of your wallets and uh, and crypto addresses. So, um, I you know I I I really um, I really enjoy this period. By the way, can you hear me well? I'm, I want to yes. make sure that I'm using the right um, microphone here. That's not. Yeah, on. I hear you perfectly. No, oh, but you know what? I have a better mic. Uh, let's try that. Is that better? Oh, well, now it's much yeah. better. Yeah, I was suspecting that uh, it's not working, not w using the mic. <laughs> anyway. Yes. So, um... So for me, you know, it's the, the only effect that this, you know, winter summer has is whether it's a uh, hard or uh, easy to, you know, close a funding round for, for a business, uh, mm -hmm. because, you know, the mood changes and, you know, investor, they get cooler or hotter based on the general atmosphere. But other than that, I don't, I don't feel the effect. Also, because I'm not appealing with my product to the crypto community. That's not the target audience. It's a, it's a social network. Um, it's a social utility. It's not uh, something that, um, you know, uh, it, it has to do with uh, um, DeFi or, you know, owning tokens or swapping tokens. It's, it's a completely new thing. And this is why, by the way, our first alpha customer was just, a, 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 you know, was a, was a regular person with regular audience that running the uh, YouTube channel Star Wars Theory, um, which is a great channel about Star Wars. 
uh, with a lot of audience that love Star Wars uh, and you know most of them don't even care or know what blockchain is and that was our first alpha customer and our goal was for D-Web for D-Web for BBS ah, for D -Web is the company that building the BBS product this is BBS network mm -hmm. uh, that you can see at bbs.market it's a uh, it's kind of a decentralized Reddit in general. Uh, we, we can go uh, on into that, but but we will. The space, we will. Uh, uh, we, uh, we we can go into that, and then we can chat about Web three. But <laughs> so really, uh, you know, it's uh, it wasn't about getting to crypto users. It was uh, about getting to regular users, and um, and we build the entire experience and the entire product in order for the blockchain to be completely in the background. However, the blockchain is fun is filling a very, very critical, I would say, foundational function. Uh, because the difference between um, what we're doing and you know uh, other people are doing in the blockchain space that is social, the difference between that and Facebook or Twitter or uh, Reddit, all these other tools is that the data is completely public. It's open to the entire world, not just for reading all the data of the social network, but also for writing data. For, uh, uh, and, and, and that difference is just, you know, you can imagine what would happen if Facebook, uh, and, and you know, Twitter used to be like that long, long time ago. But uh, early beginnings, you can imagine what will happen if you would just let anyone uh, write their own Facebook uh, mobile app um, that can read all your data and, you know, write posts and comment to other people. This would mean something completely different. You know, that you, you will have a different, I would say, industry altogether. You wouldn't see so many social networks. Let's start with that because it doesn't make sense to have, you know, so many profiles and different network. And the funny thing is that each social network was created um, based on consumer technology. That's that's you know because we used to have just computers, and there were several social networks running around. Facebook was the winner, okay, and of of the PC era. And everyone was using Facebook. I guess it has something to do with Harvard and and and, and the you know the prestige that has to do with that and and it, you know it was a good solid product and, and all of that. And it became the you know what actually the the actual reason you know I'm diverging, but I think it's interesting. The actual reason that I believe Facebook uh, became the winner. It's because it was the first social network that insisted on two things. The first thing is that you, you need to use your real name. Before that, social networks were about, you know, some nickname, avatar, anonymity, and, uh, and all of that. Um, but just, just yeah. <laughs> My kid thought he can come here and play the PlayStation. That that would that would be noisy. <laughs> no, no worries. I, I I run the risk of my kid entering at any time. Yeah. So so the first thing was was real names, but the second thing, not less important, is real connections. So if you would in the beginning, in the early days of Facebook, if you would add someone as your friend, Facebook would actually ask you, how do you know that person? And you can say, oh, we're in the same school, we met, we're family, we, we hooked up. We, you know, they, they had like 10 different answers, which made you wonder even why they're asking, because it's not like this information was displayed anyway. But the last option was, I don't even know this person. <laughs> I don't really know this person. Like, and, and then Facebook would present a message. So why are you adding him as a friend? Like to signal you, this is not how we work here. <laughs> this is not how we, uh, how how this works here. And 
And that created a, a situation. I mean, that was a, a kind of in the, in the DNA that, that there was real people, real names, and real connection between people that I think mapped to the real world. And, 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 and because of that, made Facebook just much better than all this other social network that were like, you know, fun time to spend was like random chat room for, you know, in, 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 if, if you don't know your friends, if you never met them, if you don't even know their names and, and Facebook took it to like, okay, we're mapping the real world here. And I think that was a huge difference and they became the winner in the kind of PC era when everyone using computer, but then feature phone came along. And everyone got a feature phone before the smartphones. And feature phone had this nice feature that they, they could do two things. You can make calls, but you can also send SMS, a revolution. A whole new social network was built around this consumer technology, SMS. We call it Twitter. You know, that's the source of 140 characters. <laughs> now yeah. it's 280, but, you know, uh, ancient history. Yeah, but, the concept of the you, a new consumer technology was actually, uh, you know, was actually the foundation, the basis for a whole new social network that leveraged that, um, you know, that technology well, and we call it Twitter. Then came the smartphones, the you know, iPhone and others, and all of them at that point had a camera and here mm -hmm. a new social network was born we call it instagram you know you have a camera you have a computer you can run some effects it's nice a fully new social network just because we have now phones with cameras that face yeah, there were a ton of apps like that remember i remember instagram kind of took off because a simple feature which was the filters remember that yeah 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 yeah, and you know, obviously the, 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 there was a competition, but the, the point is that it did not happen in the existing social networks, which, you know, I think it's kind of a, uh, it's a kind of a sign that big companies cannot innovate. <laughs> you know, they just are not capable of innovation. Well, but, but they're very capable of copying. Look, look at what oh, happened with Snapchat. Yeah, yeah, they yeah, offered them $3 billion for a purchase. Snapchat said, no thanks and what happened after that facebook did their facebook stories and instagram did their instagram stories and now twitter does there's <laughs> yeah yeah definitely a snapchat feature that just, makes just a big. Another and then by the way we you know we also had the um we, the, the next consumer technology was the uh, the, the video video capabilities uh, of of your, and then we got Snapchat. <laughs> Snapchat was the first one that you know video was kind of a big deal, and they realize how sensitive it is, so they made it that it disappears, uh, ephemeral as they call it, uh, after a while, and that was kind of the formula that caught. But again, it's consumer technology that driving a whole new social network that leveraged it well. And then the last one is that we got a very powerful front-facing camera that can also record video while your phone is, uh, you know, monitoring and showing you, uh, you know, your picture, making every smartphone essentially an editing room. And the social network that leveraged that is obviously TikTok. TikTok was the first social network in which the video content was produced on the end you know end customer end user machine on its end user computer and they they created the studio for recording video within uh you know w within the, the, the their software and we saw that you know kind of completely explodes Yes. Uh, and we have ready to go templates like with you know pre-recorded voice or pre-recorded yeah. dance and just you know now you go and it also takes a bit of the hardship of creating something brand new from zero when you can you know take a template just copy something just follow a trend 
right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, I think you know a lot can be said on on the kind of content that each of those social networks kind of you know um, uh, excelled in, if if you will. Um, you know, with TikTok, that was obviously uh, in in people lip syncing, a lot of beautiful girls dancing. You know, the kind of stuff that it's very easy to produce at home, and you can imagine a lot of. Uh, uh, customers to, or a lot of uh, audience for for that uh, for, for that format, but the point is that this is completely nonsensical today. The situation that was created that you have per kind of media type you have a different social network. <laughs> now, obviously, everything everyone is adding. You know, now uh, YouTube added TikTok and uh, Facebook added TikTok and Instagram. Added TikTok and you know, and and uh, everyone added stories, uh, so everyone's copying from each other, you know. So it's not like, yeah. but it's it's only about how they were born initially, how they were created, and and got to critical mm -hmm. mass. Uh, but this this situation where now you have to have an account here, an account there, and if I follow you here, I don't see you there, so maybe I want to follow you there, and I get some of the content here. It just doesn't make any sense. From a system perspective, right, and also you you have those those the you have now the 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 part where we're going to you know the the content um, control over content and content moderation. So that's that's also something that that becomes very very hard to manage, right? Uh, we've seen uh, late examples of uh, of that, but. Yeah. Now let's let's get a bit into Web three. I want to say so, something. Yeah, but I yeah. want to say something about it, and I think it's a good plug to Web three. All those weird phenomena, and I I do treat them as weird phenomena. That you know you have so many social networks that are kind of parallel to each other, and that you have kind of debates in the Senate about censorship, where they bring the CEOs of those social networks to 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 try to explain themselves. This is all a, you know, a problem. This is a, those are problems that are result from the fact that those social networks were created on top of proprietary databases. Proprietary databases. And when you have proprietary databases, and that's your value, that's, your, you know, uh, that, that's where you drive your value from, then then first you have you know different unconnected social network but also you have debates about about censorship because it's a, it's I, I i like to call it it's a monopolistic state of mind people cannot think outside the monopoly they it's hard for them it's like when the internet was introduced no one understood it because people could not think outside the monopoly of big you know, data network, uh, like AOL. And <coughs> when open source came along, people did not understand it because they could not think outside the monopoly of, of you know, Microsoft and Oracle and, and, and the big software infrastructure platform companies that, that we had back then. And we see the same thing now because people talk about censorship in the freaking Congress. I mean, guess what? There's another uh, uh, industry that censors. It's the ISPs, the Internet Service Providers. They censor all the time. Good things. You know, sometimes they censor um, malicious, um, you know, sites, which I'm happy they're blocking me and warning me fr from that. Uh, some ISPs will charge you more in order to censor porn or violence. Or, you know, in Israel, there's ISPs that will charge you extra in order for for the internet not to work on 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 sh shabbat you know it's like so why didn't we see any problems or any major problems and definitely not you know in, in this this scale with the internet because it's not a monopoly because i can choose my isp i can choose who provide me the internet i cannot choose who provide me my facebook in fact, the only online service that you can choose to provide to you is email. 
an old relic from, from the old days that has its own set of problems. Which arguably, was, or arguably is also Gmail is kind of the undisputed uh, biggest player. It's the biggest prior player, which is, by the way, part of the set of problems that he had. But, you know, Outlook is big and, you know, and each company, they have their own and you don't need to use the Gmail interface. And by the way, because it's not monopolistic, even when you're using Gmail, you're free to use your own email client, what Facebook and Twitter and Reddit would never let you do. Some no. of them used to let you before they figure out where the money is. But <laughs> they, 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 they wouldn't let you do it today from obvious business considerations. Uh, you, you, can, you can understand that, you know, they, they cannot control the, the, the ad sales in this way. And, you know, someone will create a, a client that doesn't show ads or whatever. And, and, and what, what really, you know, what's really happening here is that we're thinking in a form of, oh, yeah, sure, there should be just one Facebook. And we're not thinking about it like email, where, you know, companies like Superhuman raising a lot of money, creating a new email client. And guess what? I spent more time on my social networks than email. Why wouldn't companies raise a lot of money creating those? Because of a monopolistic approach. Now, the reason the email is the only one is because it was invented in a time that there were no public databases. The technology did not exist. And because of that, uh, it had a lot of problem. There's no user directory of email. Because there was no public database when, you, if, if, if email was invented today, when we have blockchain technology, there was a user directory. And you would see much less, you know, phishing and all that, and digital signature will make everything very, very secure. In fact, if you had something like that, I'm not sure Facebook would happen. With email, you can imagine that, you know, if you had a public database back in those days, we can have a little token, call it stamps. And I, you know, and my email client can demand 10 cents of uh, worth of stamps if you're sending me email and you're not in my address book. So it's unsolicited email. So you need to pay 10 cents. It's not a lot of money, but those four lines of codes would end spam forever. You know, very simple solution for spam. And you know what? If I'm still getting spam, price could be higher. If I'm very important person, I hire even, even more. But we didn't have that technology, so we built, you know, the email was built the way it built, and this is why it's the only survivor from that time where everything was open, everything was open source even. Uh, you know, we had news groups we had that, that did basically message boards. We had um, IRC that did, you know, what we use uh, WhatsApp and Discord and all of those tools today. It's, and the ICQ. <laughs> yeah, n nothing, nothing was was really invented in terms of kind of, you know, the, the, the basics. But they didn't have a database. And and because of that, email did not and still doesn't work well, so well. You know, it's still a very, very uh, problematic solution. Um, but it works. It had to work. Uh, we had to make it work because guess what? The entire identity system of the Internet was based on your email. That's how you recover your password. That's how you used any, you know, any online service. Uh, and it was the only solution until a smartphone became, you know, very, very common. Now you can actually use your phone number. Yeah, and the biometric phone. thing started with the digital yeah, ID and, then, and, then and with your face ID and the fingerprint. Yeah. So basically, you know, uh, the, uh, what, what I want to say is that the, the situation today is not normal in any way, shape, or form, but it's hard for the common person to think outside of the monopolistic state of mind yes. and, 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 and realize that there, we shouldn't have a debate about censorship. Anyone can choose his own censor. Even the fact that one person, one company has so much control over human consciousness from crying out loud. You know, they, they can decide what you know, what you don't know, what to suppress, what not to suppress. It's crazy as, as, as even to think about it. 
And the yeah. craziest thing so, is that yeah. there is not even um, it. We only have the 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 illusion of choice. Like if you're saying no, I'm more in Instagram than in Facebook. But if you if you if we talk about censorship, like the recent thing that happened with Andrew Tate, for example, I think he got banned from all of the networks in the same day. Like he got banned from Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram. Uh, uh, you know that on on TikTok on that same day they're on the same yeah. day they come. Yeah. So how, how I wouldn't, does that happen? I, I wouldn't expect anything else. I mean, you know, when you have four, five, six social network that are essentially running the entire world communication, you know, or 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 mass communication, if you will, today or modern mass communication then you can only expect them to work together uh, and, 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 you know, coordinate those things because they don't want to do, you know, double job. You know, if, if, if you got to a conclusion that someone is, <laughs> is problematic and, you know, they're also from the same geographic location, usually uh, sharing same worldview in many aspects, I, I must say. So... So it's not even surprising, but the fact that you can even, I mean, you cannot really say, oh, I'm, I don't like Facebook, I'm using Instagram, because guess what? There's a different audience on Instagram, and it's a different network of connections. And well, in that case, Instagram is also owned by Facebook, so it's yeah, not like and, the... <laughs> but it's not it's not really a choice you know a, a real choice is i don't like the gmail client so i'm going to use superhuman that's choice because i'm using the same email network what happens here is those social network they own the network they own this social graph as sometimes they like to call it mm -hmm. and and with each network when it's successful and useful there's something really interesting that happens we call it the network effect that as the network is bigger, the value that is derived from that is the exponential of its size. So if you're talking about network of 10 people versus a network of 100 people, the 100 people network is not 10 times better. It's a thousand times better. And the reason is that you measure the value of the network not by the number of nodes, but number by of the number of put exactly exactly so you know that i'm preaching to the choir <laughs> but the, uh, so so the network effect generates a lot of value if if the network is doing something that you know people seem to like and useful and when the network is private the only beneficiary of this network effect of the financial side of this network effect is the monopoly but when the network is decentralized when the network is public as i like to call it then the public is the main beneficiary from the network effect and this is why we're benefiting so much from the internet and there's no single company that you know is 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 uh, monetizing the the network in a you know a, a, more than everyone else combined and i think that it's clear uh, at least, you know, to, to, to those who are familiar and those that think about it, just like it was, it was clear to, to people that deal with, dealt with the internet in 95 that the internet will take over. And it was clear to people that dealt with open source uh, in, you know, in the early 2000s that this, it will take over. And I think that it's clear today to people that deal with blockchain that it would take over those services. It's just a question of when and a question of how. Right. But, and, and, and I, this is kind of where I am in terms of, um, uh, you know, how I think about it. And, you know, it's, it's hard to know how it will happen. But in, uh, in, in BBS Network, we, we chose the... Reddit model, if you will, uh, where people join groups and join communities 
And those communities are doing essentially content curation because anyone can post, but then the community is moderating it and, and people upvote and people comment and you know, the, the system figures out which, uh, you know, which posts are the top posts of every day and make it more visible. It's basically, I like to call it a crowd curation uh, mechanism. And and there's also a you know a, a person curation model which is what we see on Twitter and Facebook where you follow someone. It's not like you're becoming part of a community, but you follow someone specific. Mm-hmm. And now today again, everyone has everything. Uh, Facebook uh, has Facebook groups, even Twitter has communities, and Reddit allow you to follow other people. So it's like. <laughs> The, yeah, it's always the a question of what, what's the main focus, what's kind of the, 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 yeah. the, the main trigger, right? But yeah, yeah. so let me, let me, let, let's take, take it back so that, so that our viewers also um, understand Web3 is kind of a new term, right? We still speak in terms of blockchain, uh, crypto smart contracts, but let's, so let's get a bit into Web3 and why is it that a new term? What do you think it means? And why do you think it's important? So, you know, Web 2, I was, uh, I was there when it happens. I was in, you know, uh, I was in the internet with Web 1, but, but all of a sudden there was Web 2. And Web 2 was really about online services. That was it's all about. And the fact that people created amazing, whether it was it, photo sharing or instant messaging or uh, publishing or every, everything that that really allowed very, I would say, sophisticated uh, use of, of information network, of data network, uh, where, where you would create your account and usually there were like, you know, it, it w- there was a network that was created, the network effect, again, whether it was social networks and, and, and you know, or, or all those sites. And, and w- because, because Web1 was mostly about consuming content, like searching and, and reading content. Mm-hmm. And, and Web2 Read really took it, took it to the online services era. Web3, is also online services and online services is you know obviously it's changed everything in in this planet you know it's uh, online data services are the revolution of our recent decades but sure. it created again it created monopolies that stifles innovation and stifle choice and and those two are very much related innovation and i would say progress is a result of choice uh, the, the, the reason that free markets are successful is because people can choose and they choose what's better. And this is why countries that, you know, adopted free markets evolved much quicker than, company, than, than countries that didn't. The same goes for nature. You know, uh, we have uh, a, a, a choice mechanism that, uh, that is mostly based on females on most species where the female is choosing <laughs> which male would actually procreate to the next generation. And they might, and sometimes this choice is harsh, you know, with humans, it's, uh, we made it uh, uh, more, much know, more complex it's, it's, than a few yeah, set but, of parameters. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, with, with other animals, there's like, you know, 30 uh, different uh, suitors and only one would, you know, will leave to, to, to get to the next generation because it's the best and the strongest one. And, you know, this, this has resolved. This powers through evolution um, and progress. Mm-hmm. And definitely that's the case with the internet as well. But when you have monopolies, you don't have choice. That's what monopolies is all about. You're stuck with it. And, and I think that monopolies everywhere, even, even the state itself is a monopoly. For and sure. That's why you should keep the government as small as possible because, well, you know, if, if I'm not a monopoly, it means that people need to choose me. So if I'm not in the state of mind, the constant state of mind, that how can I make other people choose me, I will die. And that state of mind 
is what drives you know good service and innovation and good product because you want people to choose you but if people have no choice but to choose you then my my state of mind will it's be not really a choice <laughs> it's not about i i don't care you know and they have no choice uh, here so so what's my challenge my challenge is to bring as much resources from my customers to me <laughs> which is how governments operate they just want to get as much out of you because you don't have a choice not not a real one you know once every four years to <laughs> To vote is not, not much of a choice, and uh, how Dan Lerner coins it the illusion of the illusion of choice or the dino, the democracy in name only. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting you way to put it. Call it like that. So, but, so, so what, the same what goes you, with every monopoly. Yeah, please. So, so how? So, is do we really have? the the potential to change this from the ground up with blockchain with web3 technologies is is, is it really uh, it's not potential really it's not it? potential it's inevitable oh it's not potential because yeah. because we've seen too many instances in in, in in technology specifically that we had monopolies and don't get me wrong. I don't think monopolies are evil or bad. I, I was trying to build one with Metacafe. You just, you know, and, and it was quite clear when I built Metacafe, you know, you think about it all day. It's quite clear to you that if you're going to be successful, there's not going to be a room for anyone else because just from the nature of it. And we see that with YouTube, you know, there's not no real YouTube too. Now, because of all the censorship, you start to see Rumble, by the way, but it's their own making. Uh, so no, you, but it's a, realize, it, we call it cap, capture the market, right? And capturing the market means you become the go-to for video, for social, for yeah. And that's a, a, a horrible thing again because it takes away choice and 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 people can do whatever they want and and they can censor like uh, I, I forgot the name of uh, you just mentioned and take. there's nothing yeah. And, and it also doesn't force the, the, the platform or the software to, to upgrade it to level up because when there's a free market, right, you either level up or you level out, right? People yeah. are going to choose the other things. So you're exactly. constantly uh, incentivized and even forced to be on the edge of technology, have the best, you know, uh, and be constantly updating and upgrading. Otherwise, if you have monopoly, they can just leave it as is. Yeah, yeah, and and we had a lot of tech monopolies in in, in, in you know I, I like to think about it as three things that you can do with information in general you can uh, process information that's what the brain does and this is what a computer did with hardware and software and the there were a lot of monopolies around that in the beginning uh, about on computer platform. We had Apple, we had Commodore, we had, you know, a lot of companies that created network effect around them, but then came the PC, right? And, and no more network effect for no platform manufacturer. And then we had the same thing with software because guess what? We need infrastructure software. And we had a lot of monopolies around infrastructure software, but then, you know, open source came and all those monopolies of infrastructure. So, so I don't have anything to say against monopolies because they show us the way. They show us what people need. But and then they show us what's you wrong. Know, <laughs> but as soon as we know what people need and what kind of and uh, you know what kind of a solution makes sense, then you make a standard out of it. You're not just keep using the monopolies forever. It does not make sense for anyone except the monopoly itself. You know, it's the only the monopoly's interest to keep the monopoly. Every one of us having a better life or, you know, a better experience because uh, because of open source and the PC. So, mm -hmm. so that's one function you can do with information. You can process it. The other thing you can do with information, you can transfer it in space. This is what we're doing right now. This is what differentiates between us and animals. Like we can do it like much more efficiently than animals transfer information space talking it's a very important ability 
And with, 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 data, net, with, with, with data, we call it networks, with digital data. And with networks, we also had a lot of monopolies. We had AOL, we had Prodigy, you know, companies that created a network effect around them. But guess what? Then came the internet. And no more monopolies for transferring information over space. And the last thing you can do with information is store it through time, which is what makes us different than the hunter-gatherers, you know, because we started to write and generate intergenerational wisdom and write a Bible and, you know, science and all of that. Storing information through time uh, is, is, is the last function, if you think about it, because you can process it. This is how information is created. You process information, you move it through space and through time. There's nothing else you can do with it, right? It's just those three things. And with moving information through time, the tech solution for that was databases. And guess what? Databases was the greatest invention you know, uh, uh, that, that, that we had it, you know, we, we had a computer, we had a network, but only when databases were invented. This is where all the governments and the banks and all the big corporations in the world back in the 50s and 60s moved their entire, entire database to, it, to be digitized. It's because of the database. Such an important, fundamental um, uh, revolution. Mm. And... The standard for that is in the process of being created. This is the blockchain technology. It's a public database technology. Just like the internet was a public network technology, which is not so much different than the network, if you think about it. Yes, it has you know, protocols that help it to deal with the fact that it's decentralized. The same goes with database. You have tons of different databases, which, you know, with databases, is mostly about performance. I'm not talking about Luca performance. I'm talking about the, 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 the fact that you can store data in a consistent manner and, 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 and it's not being we done in that data. private and, and, and in private settings. It's not it's done in my server farm. It's like it's open to the entire world. And the first public database was Bitcoin. 2009 was the, the, the first example of, oh, look at that database. Everyone can read from it and everyone can write from it. But guess what? In order to write to the data, if I just let anyone write to the data, to the database, then, you know, people can spam it to death in five seconds. So you need, you need some, something to regulate that. And this is where currencies come in. It's also true to think about that to, to transfer information, there's no cost. If I talk to, to someone, there's no cost talking to him. But if I want to store this information through time, I want to save this information, there are going to be costs. First, I'm going to need, because I need to manifest this information in a physical form and keep it safe, not to mention to do it digitally. You know, to transfer information over the internet, it's not costing anyone anything. But if you want to host and store this information for a long time, that's going to have cost. You need a computer, you need a, to pay your ISP. This is a different, uh, you know, a, a, a very big difference. And because of that, uh, uh, when when we're talking, you know, when we're talking about public databases, you need to ask yourself: so who gonna carry the costs? Because it's gonna cost money. So who gonna store the data and pay the cost? And the answer that Satoshi gave us was miners. Those miners, they're gonna uh, store this information, and because we have a public database, now um, we can run a currency on that public database. In fact, Bitcoin did mostly that. We can have a, 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 a native currency to the, and that native currency would be issued to the miners, to those who keep the data you know, safe and secure and, 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 and safe, if, if you will. And those miners, uh, uh, they will get all the, the, the new issuance of tokens, but the end users, in order to use the data, to write data on this public database, they need that token. Where are they going to get it? They're going to get it from miners. How are they going to get it? You know, in some, you know, exchange. Doesn't matter. They buy it from them directly. It doesn't matter. But it makes sure that those miners are compensated for doing the work of storing the information that actually costs 
money. And I think this is why a lot of people are confused in the blockchain e industry as they see it mostly as a currency thing. Now, currency is a very important use of databases. You know, the, the, the first users of databases in the 60s were banks, and they used it to run ledgers. Of course, this is a very important use case, but it's hardly the only one. <laughs> it's just a very important one. And, uh, and I think a lot of people are confused to think about blockchain in that realm because you cannot have a blockchain without a native currency because otherwise it wouldn't work. No one would be incentivized to keep it up. And because we have a native currency for each blockchain, it, it, it sometimes clouds the fact that it's not really about the native currencies. It's really about being a public database, which is probably the most important innovation we ever had in technology. So, you know, if we thought the internet was important innovation, a public network, again, nothing happened when we invented the networks. Uh, for computers. Everything happened when we invented the database. So, so of course, you need both. Yeah, it doesn't, have, doesn't help me if I have database and no one can one access it remotely, you know. Mm -hmm. but, but that was, it, you know, that was a huge revolution that, that changed everything. And I think we're going to see the same thing now. So, you know, going back to your question, it's inevitable monopolies they always you know they, they evaporate it, it's just a matter of when and how but it's not a question of if there's no question of if because the monopoly is only good for the monopoly itself it's bad for everyone else and and that's why i'm so sure of it yeah take us a bit into your world uh tell us what your uh, path has has led you to you know we want to know more about uh, your creator experience and your entrepreneurial road what 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 were the things that that sparked your your curiosity that that made you understand first of all that you want to be an entrepreneur and this is what you want to dedicate yourself to then you know i want to i want you to get into a bit of the aha moments that you got and then we'll get a bit into some pitfalls that you experience that you know can help our audience to become better entrepreneurs themselves so um you know for me i, I think uh, it, you know it probably has to do something with my father who was entrepreneur in real estate but oh. you know the model that I had at home was not of someone that goes you know to do some corporate job every day and I got you know model of someone who's creative of thinking you know about new ideas and implementing sometimes succeeding sometimes less but you know so it I think that when you grow up in a place like that it's it's almost inevitable that you'll become an entrepreneur <laughs> because you know and and I, I I did I did try for for a while. Uh, so initially, I, I my first job out of the military, I was in the Israeli intelligence, where I learned most of what I knew back then about technology. Um, right after that, I, I joined a startup. It was ninety seven. Okay, it was in data networking and. Um, you know, I, it was a lot of fun. I, I, I really had a blast. And, and that was, start was acquired by Cisco after, you know, 18 months or so. And I moved to the Silicon Valley to work for Cisco. You know, I couldn't do it for more than three months. I was like, oh, my God, you know, this is, this is so much not for me. You know, when you <laughs> sh share business card on, on, on a meeting with people from your company, you know. Because it's so big, and everything is slow, and everything is political, and it's just not not me. Uh, and at that time, there was a you know three guys in Israel that created an instant messenger called ICQ. You mentioned it before, and I was like, oh my god, those guys, like three guys in Israel, could change the internet. I, you know. I, I'm going to, you know, give it a go myself. You know, this is amazing. And 
and and I did. I created a, 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 you know my first album was in '98. Was a social network called Contact.com. Uh, it was really nice. We we got some good people from the Silicon Valley. We raised uh, some money, uh, a lot of money. You know, it was '99 after all. Uh, that was the dot com uh, bubble, and you know, after the bubble was burst, no one wanted to invest in social network. I, I should have recorded those meetings that I had with so many VCs trying to explain that social networks is a great concept and it's going to take over the world. And they're like, no, this whole internet is a fad. You know, it's you know, we don't care about that. And I, for. A year, I, could, I couldn't raise a dime. We had to shut down the company. Talking about setbacks, you know, that was the first one. Um, and, and then, in, you know, about a year later or so, I, I tried for a long time to, to, to create a video sharing uh, um, service. <clears throat> because there were none at the time. And I thought, you know, this is... I thought it, this is going to be really big, and I created Metacafe, which initially was not even a web service. It was a downloadable application because the bandwidth was too goddamn expensive, uh, and we had to transfer those huge video files with peer-to-peer -peer file sharing protocol between our users because no one could afford bandwidth, and you know it was still hard to raise any money. But, you know, that change in 2004 and 2005, where we actually, you know, we moved to kind of a web service model uh, and, and, and YouTube came out as well. Now, YouTube were like much more experienced people from PayPal, you know, they build like scalable service. We, we were like the first Internet service built out of Israel. We had to train all our people in, in LAMP, you know, it was... Uh, uh, Linux. Uh, uh, what is LAMP for? Uh, uh, Linux, Apache, Apache, uh, and uh, uh, MySQL and PHP. MySQL and PHP. Right. Or Python, you know, started as well. So <laughs> it also worked for LAMP. We were like the first one to do that. Everyone was using Microsoft technologies in Israel because it was all corporate-based internet development. So. So, you know, we had a lot of struggles and a lot of uh, challenges, but I think the, the biggest miss that we had on Metacafe is that we didn't, I didn't fully understand the, 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 the true meaning of the long tail. The fact that, you know, um, it's really about um, every user would go and see different videos. You know, we were thinking about more of in, in, in kind of a framework of a TV or whatever. Like, show me the best videos, the best hits. And most video sites at the time, even though they were not user generated, did something like that of showing you kind of the best stuff every day. Uh, and it was very successful. We became the number one video destination in six months, like with a million users every day. Amazing. But the potential was like, so much higher uh, with the long tail. But it took longer. Uh, it took a bit longer for YouTube to create their, I uh, almost want to call it a video search engine, which is what they did or build in the beginning. Um, but, you know, we, we discovered that the most popular videos are a tiny fraction of the demand for videos. I mean, who, who goes to most popular videos anymore? It's just, everyone's just going to their own niche because I think what I learned is that as, as much as the, 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 the subject matter, the topic of the video is, is, is smaller niche, the more passionate the end user will be uh, around that. And, and, and more passionate means a lot more time. I mean, uh, yeah, you can spend some, you know, uh, 10 minutes watching the, the, the most viral videos online every morning. But if you are learning guitar, you're probably going to spend hours and hours watching guitar videos, or you know, if you and you uh, will uh, you will narrow your search to the you know the the, the B 
Beatles, Queens, and Metallica yeah. riffs that are that are your favorite. Exactly. exactly. Specific songs you want. And to if learn. you like soccer, you like a specific team. You 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 gonna spend all time all day just watching their clips online and and. Uh, so you know, I think that was a, a very very big lesson. The, the book didn't even came when we started the company. It came while we were you know running. Uh, Meta Cafe, the whole theory about the long tail. And uh, in 2010, I think it was clear that uh, YouTube kind of, um, you know, took, uh, Google bought them and they become kind of the dominant platform, the monopoly, if you will. It was not us becoming the monopoly, it was them becoming the monopoly. And uh, I, I was in the Silicon Valley, I was living in Palo Alto, I moved back to Israel, my, my first kid was born, so I wanted to grow up with his grandparents. And you know, sitting at home and actually using this technology, I, I started to uh, dive into a lot of different topics. Uh, among them, I started to be interested in conspiracy theories. I had the time for that, you know. <laughs> and it was fascinating, but, but it was also useful because in May 2011, on one of my favorite conspiracy blogs, his name was James Corbett. It was called, it's called still uh, the Corbett Report. Obviously censored from all the big platforms, but uh, independently active. And they had a one hour episode about Bitcoin. And I was like blown away. I mean, this is where you, you would read about this kind of stuff, would discover about something like Bitcoin. Maybe if you're an ultra, you know, geek mathematician, I don't know, working on cryptography, maybe you'll hear about it from those places. But from in semi normal normie like myself, uh, you know, it was conspiracy sites that were talking about you know, the blow to the financial system. Yeah, yeah. That the, the end you know, of the central banks. And the... Yeah, yeah, all that. And, you know, that, that got me so excited. Uh, oh, you know what? I, <laughs> I have something here. I have a prop. I never showed it to anyone. Okay, so this is something my... A uh, family member uh, got me as a present. So mm. this is actual copy of, uh, an email. Yeah, of the email that I sent. Look at the date if you want. Uh, Check I'm out showing, Bitcoin. I'm showing this graph. Fourteen dollars, you see? Fourteen dollars. <laughs> like, guys, this is the next thing. You should go. You should buy it now. And I send it to my entire address book. Like everyone, I, every email that I had, I send this email. Obviously, I got responses. Eyal, you got a virus. Uh, <laughs> and I was like, so what I did? I sent this email again. And uh, with the title, this is not a virus. This is me, Eyal, your friend. I'm writing you this. Take a look. So from mm -hmm. hundreds and hundreds of people, only three uh, actually bought it. Uh, and uh, they were very unhappy that they did because right after that, it got to 30 and crashed to $2. So they were like, oh my God, Eyal, you made us lose, lose our money. But I still suggested them to keep them, not to sell it, and, and, and see what happens. Right. Um, so I got so excited about this technology because, and I didn't know why. I didn't understand why. It took me, I think, seven or eight years to, to explain to myself why this technology is so excited, exciting. And, you know, I was also, I think, but you already uh, I would it. say... I, I would say to explain myself correctly, because in the beginning, I was clinging to that narrative that many people, I think, holding that, yeah, it's against the banks and financial institution and, you know, stick it to the man or whatever. But, you know, I was young, I was stupid. <laughs> and I, I, I don't think that anymore. I think, you know, I, I think the opposite. I think that you can say whatever you want about 
all human institution. The fact is that they got us to here. The reason that we yeah, can and have you this cannot blame the players, right? The, the, the incentive mechanisms is there for right now. It's set up so that the the top priority is maximizing profit, and that's you know that's how the system. But set you know up. That, that that's good thing because of the fact that people want to maximize profit. We have free markets. And we have free economy and giving the experimentation of history, that is by far the best way to push forward progress. If you look at history, I don't think there's any problem because what is profit? You know, I would, I, I, have, I have something I like to tell people that if that, that greed in a truly free market is philanthropy. Greed in a free market is free. And, and, and I can explain it with a very simple example. Let's say we create the freest market in the world. We take a thousand uh, people that are pure hearted and good people. We put it in the islands and we give each of them uh, 1,000 coins. 1,000 coins. And we say, use those coins to cooperate because you know money is an instrument of cooperation collaboration of cooperation between and you know they would definitely do it someone will be really good at fishing someone will do really good at building someone will grow bread and everything will work free market for the benefit of all of them right now let's say that one of those thousand person people is a grid mf and he's not an f it's actually a phil philanthropist and i'll explain why he's greedy he wants money so he's going to be obsessed all day how what can I make that would make those other people give me their money? What the best service, the best thing that they cannot even think about that they want that will make them give me my, th their money. And maybe he's thinking about it. He's building a new type of raft or whatever, you know, and everyone's excited about it. Oh, this is amazing. And they, you know, they buy this raft and he's making and piling more and more and more and more money and he's greedy. So he's not spending it. He's just piling this money. What happened? The real value is not the money. The real value is, is the product and services. What this person did is created an amazing raft for his fellow citizens, but he's not asking anything is returned. He has all this social credit, those piles of money at home, social credit that he can use to get stuff, to get labor from other people. You're going to come and clean my house. You're going to come and clean my toilet. You're gonna... But he's not using it. He's just keeping, he's a philanthropist. He's just giving and giving value and, you know, taking nothing in return from the collective. So when we say greed, when we say profit and we look at it as a bad thing, I, I'm not sure about it. I, I think that this is the most sophisticated tool of collaboration ever invented. When you look at your mobile phone, you see, where's my mobile phone? This is a collaboration between millions of people. And when I paid, I don't know, a thousand bucks for it, it went to those millions of people all around the world that got the materials and developed the chips and developed the software. And I don't think it's a bad thing. I, 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 I think, and, and when we criticize today's society, again, it's okay to you think that you have a better idea how to do things and it's okay to try it and sometimes it will be a good idea and sometimes it would move evolution but guess what most time it won't most ideas are really 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 bad and we're trying to make revolutions and reorganize society it ends in a disaster each and every time and it's just bigger and bigger disasters because we become scalable and scalable so i don't like this whole talk of oh we gotta you know freaking change the you know the the, the, the monetary system all together and we're gonna you know, just use this new thing wait wait i think that 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 state you know evolution should be gradual because you don't want to break things because you don't want unappreci to, to uh, unappreciate 
what we have today. We got to this point where we can invent Bitcoin on top of an internet and, and have those podcasts thanks to the old system and the old institution. And we can see perfectly well what happens in countries that did not adopt them. We got rid of half of the poverty in the world in the last 20 years. So, again, this is why I said back then I was a little younger, I was a little more stupid, <laughs> and I thought about the world differently. It's not how I think about it today. Today I appreciate what we have, what got us here, and think about maybe, maybe, that's the key word, I can contribute to make it a little better. But it's up for the market to decide that. Mm -hmm. Anyway. I'm ranting. So. so is that the approach that you would suggest new entrepreneurs building on Web3 to have? Like in terms, instead of this is going to revolutionize the way we do X or change the world in this way, uh, you would suggest going in uh, into creating a new Web3 business by saying, okay, let's see where I can think of ways to do this a little better. Or, uh, or I, 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 think, I think in general, it's okay to say this trend, this technology, this, I think it will change the world. And, you know, many people that said it were, were right. You know, everyone that said it about the internet, everyone that's saying it today about blockchain, everyone that said about open source, and everyone that said about computers, and many other things, they... They were right to assume that this is going to be a pivotal technology that changes everything and, and the world. But never said it about your own company. <laughs> you know, it's my company. It's my product. That, because that's just, just that, uh, how do you call it? It's gr too much of a grandiose thinking. I mean, maybe your company can take a big part of it. Uh, can can be a huge part of this trend, but it's not like your company is what going to. Maybe you can do it better than others. Yes, mm -hmm. and like Facebook did, and they are very dominant. But it's not Facebook that changed the world. It's social networks that changed the world. It's Web two. Right. It's the internet. It's not Facebook per se. Yeah, you just so, build the product that uh, 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 that kind of maximize the value extraction from that new evolved, new idea that, that was they built the right they, time. they build the product that most people choose mm -hmm. it started mm -hmm. with that now after that they started to expand but the basic thing is they build what most people choose because it is about choice in in, in, in you know at least definitely in the beginning now it's you know when they created the network it's a monopoly but in the beginning, it was a choice. And most people choose that, uh, chose that uh, particular. So, and, and, and the other thing is, you know, I see, uh, it's, it's a generic example, but there were a lot of uh, companies, still many companies that building DAOs you know, since 2016. And DAOs, you know, people that build DAOs, they came with all kind of models of, you know, people going to work together and decide differently. And again, I'm not against anything, trying everything, you know, it's good to try. But, but it's sometimes, you know, gradual steps are better because we saw that the successful DAOs were the simplest one that you can imagine like the simplest form of voting that looks almost like a shareholding voting in a company then you know then all those sophistications that DAO. a lot of people that talk about oh the community should make decision uh, without sometimes realizing the value of leadership i mean throwing away everything that we used to do as and, and think about is bad uh, it's almost trendy it's almost mm -hmm. like, oh, yeah, the world sucks, and I, I, I figure out why. I think this is a dangerous line. You know, people that actually act on those kind of thoughts could be dangerous of thinking, oh, everyone's stupid, but I'm smarter, and I know what's best for everyone. You know, you can think about several examples of hist in history that people thought like that. Uh, so, again, believing in changing the world, but 
is, is great, but not not because your company and 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 believing that people would be different is is also great, but realize that this is a very very slow gradual process of people changing how they act and how they uh, work. They we don't change quickly. You know, you want to believe that as a young child that oh this. You know, you see that in a movie that someone is making this speech and everyone changes. Had the epiphany. And yeah, that's it. <laughs> doesn't work like that in 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 the real world. Yeah, uh, let's let, let's give uh, the new Web three creators an insight. What would be kind of your or number one or at least a very essential uh, tip or guiding line that you would tell someone that is right now really excited about Web3, but it's also, you know, bombarded with all this new projects type of narratives, DeFi, NFTs, metaverse, you know, all things that are trending and wants to focus, narrow the focus and build something new on Web3. What would you, what would you advise them? Um, I would advise to beware of dog fooding. Uh, you know, this is what we did with DeFi, which is great. Uh, the users of DeFi technology was people from the blockchain industry. This is how blockchain people invested in their own companies and speculated on their own projects. And But when we're talking Web3, it's not it's not a crypto thing it's not a crypto industry uh, again if you look at it, the, the internet industry uh, had you know all this speculation around internet stocks happening in Wall Street with with blockchain it's happening on our own platform which is amazing it's it's, it's an amazing achievement but that shouldn't fool you to think that the entire world is going to become blockchain geeks with MetaMask and, and, and hardware wallet. This is, this is not going to change that fast. And some people, you know, they, they, they manage to use WhatsApp and Facebook today, even old, older people, they manage to use basic tools, but don't think anything is going to change quickly uh, on, on, on that front. And, and when, you know, when building the new, I, I think there's endless potential, endless potential, because everything is going to be just like when the internet came, came around, it's like the entire software industry had to rewrite itself. And, and obviously 99% of the stuff was new stuff that was not available, but even the word processor became a web. It's like everything migrated. It's changed everything. And the same process is going to happen here. It's a question of how, it's a question of when, and, and, and it's not going to be modeled on anything that we achieved in blockchain so far. Mm -hmm. uh, and good luck, you know, and, and move with small steps and, and you know, generate value. No, we, is, we, uh, we, would, we could sum it up into, yes, build on Web3, but Build for normies. <laughs> build, build with the normie mindset in terms of yeah. your user, right? Yeah. Your because user Web three for me, that, that's what it means. It means that this amazing technology is starting to get to the normies, because we've been dog fooding for a decade and and and, and, and a, a bit more, and you know, the internet was dog fooding in the beginning as well, all through the nineties. It's only internet companies that use the internet. It, yeah. It's okay. It makes sense. But we're moving on. And it's going right. to require a different mindset. For sure. For sure. Yeah, listen, this has been amazing. I did not expect for such a, such a, such, uh, so, uh, so big knowledge bombs to, to be dropping on our very first episode. And uh, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. You know, I have a, a ton of appreciation from you. I've always admired you all be, be, 
since uh, you know uh, the, the early days and whenever I, I found out what you were building and until this day. So thank you very much for, for coming onto the onto the podcast and giving me the opportunity because we have no followers. So this is just <laughs> getting started. <laughs> My pleasure, of course. Thank you very much. Yeah, see you see you guys soon and uh, and uh, see, uh, keep creating <laughs> on this world. I will. Bye, yeah. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Web3 Creators Podcast. Make sure you follow us on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, and all of your favorite platforms. And if you're serious about building your own Web3 business, head over to web3creatordojo.com and check out our courses. That's web3creatordojo.com. See you soon, creators.